Well, it's still a couple of weeks till payday, so I wouldn't normally have anything to show at this point and instead be engrossed with some DIY projects, like learning more about how to scratch build layout scenery. But, as it happens, I had a surprise parcel from my brother to open with some Kato goodies inside. I also want to progress with my plans for making my own buildings for my layout, particularly since my initial paper craft attempt was a bit of a flop. So this video will be split between a wee unboxing and a speed build of a basic platform model. Da -da -da. Now the big surprise this week was a completely unexpected package from my brother, who is also building his own layout, but he's going down the Pico route. Even so, he did come across a job lot on eBay which just happened to include some Kato Unitrack items. In fact, he sent me down two parcels. The first of which was a very welcome bundle. It came in the form of six Kato turnout switches. Ironic, as I'd just uploaded my video featuring my very first point switch, which I had to operate manually on that occasion. Six is a wee bit of overkill perhaps, but I'm very, very grateful as it's something I now don't have to worry about moving forward. However, it's worth noting that you can daisy chain these switch units together in order to control a number of turnouts. But I'm a bit unclear as to whether there's a limit to the number of these accessories you can add together on the side of the Kato control unit. Still, it's very satisfying to be able to operate your points remotely from your controller. Though I'll have to acquire some extension cables to stretch from the control unit to wherever on the layout my turnouts are located. This has me starting to think about the amount of spaghetti that will be generated by additional wiring, but I'll shove that concern to the back burner just for the moment, as this is the early days of my layout designing plans. The addition of these switches does give you an added sense of being in control with the actual operations. I don't like the break and immersion that leaning across the layout to do things by hand causes. I believe that real remodelers call this the hand of God and I can see why some don't like having to do this. Remote switches like these often mean you can distance yourself from the layout sufficiently enough where you can feel like you're observing simulated operations but are not encroaching on the scale simulation by sticking your giant hand in the middle of things. And that thought brings us quite nicely to the second of the parcels from my brother. Da -da -da! And we come to a bit of an interesting custom piece of track that my brother cobbled together for me. A decoupling section. This contained a small selection of short unitrack sections, which are in actuality extremely handy pieces to have when planning or making a layout. A few of these are, amazingly, exactly some of the track sections that I need for the layout plan I have in mind, so I'm extremely grateful and as I don't have to buy these now. Now I've chatted in previous videos about my interest in freight operations and shunting and this brings up the issue of how I might go about decoupling trains from wagons. While I'd love to eventually work out how to integrate some sort of automatic or remotely activated decoupling system, I mentioned that I'd like to start with some simple and convenient manual mechanism and this is what my brother has come up with as a solution for that problem. It's a bit of a Frankenstein contraption but it's quite neat, isn't it? Although it does need some polishing. Right, so moving on to the second half of this video and my very, very quick scratch build of my first scenic embellishment for my future layout, a platform. Seems like a good place to start, if you'll excuse the pun. I think I may have said why I'm starting with these simple attempts at modeling. That being the problems I have with coordination due to some mild strokes that I've had. <laughs> due to my reduced dexterity, I thought it'd be best to start modestly and see how we go from there. And as a platform, not including the station buildings of course, is basically a box structure, then you can't get any more simpler than that. So off we go. Despite being a basic structure, there's one catch 
and that is that I want the dimensions of any scratch models I make to match those of Kato's one 160th engaged Diatown models so that they blend in should I wish to take advantage of any of these pre-made buildings in my layout. With the station platform in particular, there's a certain set of dimensions to follow in order for the platform to be at the right height for use with Kato's Unitrack and the train carriages that would be using this platform. So I did a fair bit of research and measuring and came up with some detailed plans based on Kato's local line station platform model. But first things first, having decided to build this model using styrene or plastic art, I had to gather some suitable materials and also the appropriate set of tools for the job of course. I selected a heavy 3mm sheet for the core assembly, spoiler alert here, I soon learned to regret that decision, and began to cut out the central U-shaped box components consisting of the two platform sides and a base strip. Now one of the nice features about cutting styrene sheets is that you don't have to actually cut all the way through. You can just score them and they usually just snap cleanly apart. I then cut the platform sloping ends which were at either side of the sidewall pieces and this really highlighted the disadvantage of going with that heavy 3mm sheet. Boy oh boy, that turned out to be hard work. Anyway, moving on it was time to glue one of the sides to the base strip using some Tamiya glue. And here, once again, I discovered that for these core structures that I had boobed somewhat and I should have really used something a bit more robust for sticking these bits together. But I persevered with the Tamiya glue. To help me support the model components as I'm going along, I used a pair of steel 123 precision blocks which, aside from being weighty, have the added advantage that, being steel, they are magnetic should I require the extra grip of a magnet to hold things in place. In any case, the magnets weren't needed in this case, but it's great to have the option should you need extra grip. The platform wall and base glued together, I then cut myself out a number of small supporting rectangles of styrene, which would act as the internal ribs of the platform. These were glued in place at intervals down the length of the platform's interior. With these firmly glued in place, I then attached the remaining outer wall. The plus side of this heavy foundation, now the glue has dried, is that I have a strong but light core structure. Still, maybe I best use something more like 1mm sheet in the future, as all this seemed basically over-engineered. But let's move on. Now, before I add the top of the platform, I need to add the detailing on the side walls. There's not all that much to do really, just some textured plastic art to represent the stone cladding on the platform's foundation, and also some edging or trim. I'll start by cutting out some stone walling to decorate the top halves of the platform sides. I'll have to stick several pieces together to run the length of the walls, as the sheet of stonework I have isn't quite long enough. I was lucky enough to find this texture pattern which seems to resemble the kind used by Kato on their rural platforms, so that's quite handy. Below the stonework on the track side of the platform is a sill or lip halfway up the wall. This seems to represent the height that Kato's Unitrack raises the actual tracks themselves and is an indicator mark should you want to add extra ballast yourself over Kato's moulded fake ballast or at least that's what I assume this piece is. Few last bits now, the actual platform itself. Just three sections of one millimeter styrene sheet cut to overhang the foundation wall by about a mill on either side. But before I glue these onto the top of my wall, I will have to add the platform edging detail, which seems to be short flagstones all the way along the edge. I'll add this detail by scoring the outline of the flagstones onto the flooring by using a special scribing tool. Now this is a new technique for me, so I'll have to do a bit of practicing first to gauge the appropriate weight at which I use the tool's nibs, if that's what you call them. After a bit of mucking about on some scrap styrene, I managed to get a feel for using the scribe, and so got to work applying the platform edging. 
That done, I dry fitted the three sections together on top of the wall, but noticed that the slope sections needed some slight adjustment to fit together neatly with the main platform section. I did some light sanding to achieve a chamfer on these edges, and soon all three bits fit together nicely, and with that, I glued them to the platform wall. And job done. Yeah, it's not the most exciting of model projects, but it's a good way to get me back into crafting models again. Everything appeared to be the right height to match the unit track and some of Kato's rolling stock, so I'm happy with that. Now, of course, this means I have to plan the adjoining station house building before I even think about doing any painting to this model. But that's for another video. I hope you enjoyed watching me faff about, and thanks very much for watching. <laughs>